Hey, thanks so much for checking out today's message at Propel Church. We believe that God is moving powerfully in our church and we would love to connect with you. So be sure to hit the like button, comment, subscribe, even share. If you want to get connected, you can visit our website, propel.church. But for now, let's lean in, take notes and enjoy God's word. Uh, We are in a message series called How to Survive an election year. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're going to make it. We are kind of navigating this series because we are entering into the election season. And last week we talked about how if we're going to survive an election year, uh, it's going to involve quite a bit of praying and fasting. We're going to need more of God than we've ever needed before uh, based on the condition that the world is and this week I want to talk to you from the topic of living in the middle. And this might not be one of those messages where you're like, oh, Pastor, I love it. You know, like this one might make you a little bit uncomfortable. And when I say living in the middle, here's what I'm not saying. Some of you are like, oh, so he's telling us to vote independent. No, no, no. That's not what, that's not, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> At all. I want to make sure you don't get it twisted. I'm not trying to push during this series a political agenda. I'm trying to teach you kingdom priorities. Because what God has called us to do as believers, if you are a child of God, if you've said, I want to, I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I am here to live for Him. If that's your posture, you are called to live different than the rest of the world. And as you live different, you're going to figure out that culture has this propensity or this tendency to force you to pick sides on things. Have you noticed this? You, anybody else feel pressure to pick sides on stuff? I know some of y'all felt pressure last night. It was like, do we, dolphins or chiefs, right? Do we, do we pick some? Somebody said, it ain't that hard, Pastor. Chiefs. The dolphins were froze, right? That ocean was cold. And we feel this pressure to pick sides. And, and so we, what, what my challenge for us to do to, today as, as followers of Jesus is to embrace what it looks like to live in the middle. But you and I feel pressure to to pick sides all the time in this culture. We feel pressure to pick sides between uh, the Crips and the Bloods. I mean, the the Democrats and the Republicans. (laughs) White people had gangs long before anybody else. Don't get it twisted. (laughs) Look at your history. We feel pressure to pick sides. You ever had this pressure of of, of, of when you hear somebody say, "Well, well, black lives matter or all lives matter. Or blue lives matter. You just felt the air suck out of the room. <laughs> Why? Because you feel pressure. Right? You feel pressure to pick a side. Who do, I, who do I side with? What do I stand for? Where's my priority? We feel pressure to pick a side. It's often said that Sundays are the most segregated times of the week right? because we feel pressure to pick sides. So we've got primarily black churches and primarily white churches. And I would just propose that God has called us to be in the middle. We've got, we've got people who don't understand their theological uh, bend or preferences, and so they go, well, well are, you, are you Pentecostal or, or are you Baptist? What if we were in the middle? This was my hardest thing when I was growing up. I first got, I first got saved, and, and I started following Jesus. People would be like, are you Baptist? I'd be like, I really love Scripture, <laughs> and I can't dance, so we're good. <laughs> Like, oh, are, are you Pentecostal? Man, I love the Holy Ghost. I can get down. You know what I'm saying? But God called me to live in the middle. I call it Bapticostal. It's charismatic with a seatbelt. What would it look like to live in the middle? We feel this pressure to pick a side. And, and, and furthermore, I'm just going to tell you because I, you know, I got 30 minutes left. Um, some of y'all got to quit listening to every pastor that got a microphone or a video on them, because there are going to be pastors in the next 12 months that tell you if you vote a certain way, primarily what they'll say is if you vote Democrat, you're going to hell. There's no way you'll make it to heaven. And can I just tell you that the only thing that gets you into heaven is Jesus, not a ballot. Okay. I'm not telling you to vote one way or the other. Here's what I will say. Anybody that adds on to the necessity of what it takes to get into heaven is missing the point. You've got to be weary of those people. 
And so as we look at this idea of living in the middle, I want to take you to the book of Joshua today. If you're not familiar with what's going on in Joshua, God has raised up Moses and he's helped deliver the people out of Egypt. They've been in bondage and captivity for hundreds of years. God sends Moses. He says, let my people go. Pharaoh finally relents. They begin to go on a journey, exiting Egypt, heading towards the promised land. It was a land flowing with milk and honey, which doesn't mean much to you and I, but it's the closest thing to heaven that they were going to get on this side of eternity. It was beautiful. It was as close to perfect as you could get. But on the journey, they realized they had a problem because just because they got out of Egypt, it didn't mean that Egypt was out of them. They still had all of these issues and hurts and bondages. And so over the course of 40 years, every person that lived under Egyptian rule would end up dying off. And then Moses would pass away. So when we open the text to Joshua chapter 1, we find this young leader who is sitting there. Who's, he's kind of watched and studied under Moses. And God says, Moses, my servant is dead. It's your turn to take over. You're about to take the reins and lead. And Joshua is like, I am not the right guy for that. He doesn't feel qualified. He's kind of scared and timid. And so God would encourage him in Joshua chapter 1, verse 7. It says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Look at this. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. You may be successful wherever you go. I I remember the first leadership lecture I ever heard was a a guy who said, hey, if if you want to make everybody happy, you should not be a leader. You should go sell ice cream. Because in leadership, sometimes when you and I I live, we're going to feel pressure on both sides. And God wants to encourage Joshua to stay in the middle. When you feel pressure to lean to the left That was my right. When you feel pressure to lean to the right or to the left, do not veer. Either way, you stay in the middle. And if you stay in the middle, you will be successful wherever you go. And so Joshua would begin to tell the people God's plan and that God was letting them go into the promised land. They sent spies over. That's what Joshua chapter 2 is all about. They scouted out the land and they come back and they report to Joshua and say, we're ready to go. Let's do this. And so in Joshua chapter 3, they head to go. And, and, and they, before they leave, the Lord gives them some instruction. He says, before you walk out, do not leave. Until the Ark of the Covenant, which is carried by the priest, leads the way. Now, for most of us, we would go, that's not pretty, that's not significant. But the Ark of the Covenant is where God's presence dwelled with his people. It was the place where God's presence would sit in earth. And as they carried, as the priest carried the presence of God, God is making sure Joshua knows, if I don't go, you shouldn't go either. Come on, that's better preaching than you, amen. If God doesn't go, you shouldn't be going there either. And so as they get ready to carry, the priest would carry the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant is really important because ultimately the Ark of the Covenant, the place where God's presence dwelled with his people, is is geared to and, and designed for pointing us to Jesus. So in the Ark of the Covenant, there were three items. The first one was a, a gold jar of manna. Because Jesus is the bread of life. The second one was a staff. It was the staff of Aaron or the budded staff of Aaron. And the reason why that's important is because Aaron was supposed to be the high priest, but they couldn't agree on whether or not he was the right guy for the job. And so all the priests brought their staff into a room and they left it overnight saying whichever staff budded when they came back in the morning, that person would be the high priest. When they came back, they saw it was clearly Aaron's staff. The reason why it lives in the Ark of the Covenant is because just as Jesus is the bread of life, Jesus is our chosen high priest. And then there's the Ten Commandments that live in the Ark of the Covenant. The, The law of God, because Jesus would be the fulfillment of that law. The ark is really important because it was where God's presence 
rested. The priest took on the responsibility of carrying this ark. They are leading the way, heading towards the promised land. And as they go on their journey, they get to an obstacle. It's called the Jordan River. And where the Jordan River was, God gave them an instruction that from the moment you put, the priest would put their foot in the water, the water would subside. You don't have to spend time building bridges when God told you to step. And so they step into the water. The water subsides. The land begins to dry out. And this is what the text says. Joshua chapter 3, verse 17. It said, The priest who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle. Turn to your neighbor say, in the middle. middle. Turn to the other person and say, in the middle. In the middle of the Jordan River and stood on dry ground. While all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. The priests who were carrying the presence of God, this was heavy, this was weighty. They had the responsibility of not just stepping into the water and then the water would move, but they stood in the middle until every single person had crossed by. I know you might not be catching what I'm putting down yet, so let me just take it a step further and help you understand the text. In 1 Peter chapter 2, you are called a chosen people, a royal priesthood. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 5, God says that he's building you up to be a priest. If you are a priest, let me, let me rephrase it, if you are a follower of Jesus, then you are a priest. You say, I don't feel like a priest. Good news is this is not based on your feelings. Amen. That's what God calls you. Yeah. You're a priest. Why? Because when you said yes to Jesus, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now lives within you. You don't carry an ark. The ark resides in you. Right. The presence of God dwells within his people. And so you are a priest. And if you were to insert your, yourself into the text today, you would be a priest who stands in the middle of the river so that people could cross by. And we're not talking about a couple hundred people. There were two million people right. that crossed by. Do you know how long it takes to get two million people? I can't get through a Chick-fil-A drive through fast. You got two million people trying to cross on dry ground. You know there were some timid people that were like, there used to be water there. That, that ground ain't dry. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to let it dry out a little more. I don't trust it yet. Two million people? You know how heavy the ark was? Yeah. It's heavy. Right. Carrying God's presence is heavy. That's right. Being a person who's willing to stand in the middle it's heavy because when you stand in the middle, you got pressure from both sides. Right. Standing in the middle puts you in tension where you don't pick a side because you realize when I pick a side, I divide. So I just stand in the middle. Come on. I'm not saying you compromise on truth. I promise for some of y'all that are a little uh, prematurely agitated with me, we're going to get there. <laughs> but God's called you to live in the middle. And here's what I know. Not everybody's crossed by yet. There's still lost people. And if there's still lost people, I think God would call us to stand in the middle. There's still people who need to cross, but are you willing to stand in the middle? Because I love the picture Joshua 3 gives. The the priests play a big role in people crossing over from where they are into God's promised land. And when we talk about living in the middle, I'm not saying that you don't take a stand for what's right or what's wrong. We're going to get to that. But here's what I learned about living in the middle. I think it's easier to pick a side than to live in the middle. Because when I pick a side, I don't worry about the other people. But what I've learned is, here's why I stand in the middle, is because the middle allows me to reach people on both sides. A lot of times we feel tension because... Everybody's got opinions. And here's what, I got opinions too. And here's what I think about my opinions. I believe they're right. (laughs) 
I know you might not believe that about your opinions. But I truly believe that about mine. I'm pretty confident that my opinions are right. And so, so I have this tension even when I live in the middle. Because I have this tendency to feel the pressure of leaning one way or the other. But I'm called to live in the middle. And when I live in the middle, I got opinions, but my opinions don't trump the call of God on my life to help people cross by. I see so many Christians lose influence with lost people because they'd rather have the applause of people who are probably already making it into heaven. You got to learn to love your call. It's heavy, but it's worth it. For some of us, we have no problem sharing our political opinions, but we won't share Jesus with other people. And my plea for you in 2024 is to remember your call. It's to remember that you're called to stand in the middle. You are literally carrying the weight of the presence of God to the world. And when two million people are going to cross by, it's going to take a long time time to do it and if you've ever carried something heavy for a long period of time you know after a while you begin to you know your your knees get a little wobbly you begin to lean one way or the other and I wonder if those priests as they were holding the presence of God watching men women children families of people cross they didn't remember the words that God gave to Joshua. Do not lean to the right or to the left. You stand here in this moment. I wrote it in my notes this way. When the world calls you to lean, stand. I think we feel this pressure and tension of when we, we can all agree, okay, neither side has it totally figured out. Okay, I thought I was going to get a little more participation. That's fine. If you think one side has it figured out, we might need to circle back on that later. Okay, (laughs) neither side has it completely figured out. And so what happens is, and we hear this culturally too, it's like, well, well, I don't really fully agree with this side or with that side, so I just begin to lean. Oh, you know, I lean right. Here are the issues I lean right on, or, or I lean left. I lean one way or I lean the other. When the world calls you to lean, stand, and I'm going to give you four things that we stand on here at Propel Church. Number one, we stand firm on God's truth. We stand firm on God's truth. If you're going to get through an election year, you're going to need more than opinions. You're going to need God's truth. It perturbs me. I get agitated. I'm trying to, I guess I'm using big words at 1030 today. I feel good. It gets on my nerves when I hear people. Like, let me tell you my truth. No, you ain't got a truth. You ain't, you, ain't, you ain't got a truth. Can I tell you why you don't have a truth? You don't have a truth because truth exists outside of you. If you and I have our own truth, then we've become our own compass of morality. And I've been hanging out with me for long enough to know I do not need to do that. <laughs> I can't be my own compass for morality. I can't define my own standard of what is right and what is wrong. Truth has to exist in a perfect being, and you and I are not it. Truth has to exist in someone who is not only perfect, but is willing to lay his life down and sacrifice. And that was God. And so here's what we believe, that the truth we live by is found in God's word. This is what uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3 says. All scripture, turn to somebody and say all. You ought to circle it, highlight it, underline it. All scripture, even Leviticus, is God-breathed. Come on. And is useful for teaching, for rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. In other words, all of Scripture. Some people say, oh, you only need the New Testament. If you find a pastor that tells you you only need a New Testament, you need to find a different pastor. All Scripture is profitable. It's beneficial. Doesn't mean when I read it, I'm going to like it or agree with it or think that, man, I really don't want to do that. You know, you ever been there? But it's profitable. It's beneficial because it helps me become more like Jesus. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped in every good work. Here at Propel Church, we believe that God's truth is not a negotiation. It is a standard. But most of the time when it comes to God's truth, people don't reject truth. They reject the packaging of it. 
Because I think sometimes we try and throw truth in the midst of our lean. What would it look like for you just to stand in the middle and for you to stand firm on God's word? Here's what we believe about God's word is that from Genesis to Revelation, it is truth. It's profitable, will equip you for good works. We don't alter the text. We don't cherry pick the text. We don't redefine the text. We don't veer to the right or to the left from the text. If God calls it sin, we call it sin. And it doesn't change just because we have loved ones, friends, or family members that are living in it. God's truth is God's truth, and we stand firm on it in 2024. And if you're going to stand firm on it, you're going to have to learn to stand in it. You're going to have to learn to open it and read it and begin to love it and consume it. You say, well, I don't, I don't know if I believe it's truth. Here's the good news. You don't read anything because you believe it's truth. If you did, you'd get off Facebook. But this is profitable and beneficial for you. If you'll begin to open it, God will begin to speak to you. If you want to hear God's voice, open his word. And if you don't have a Bible before you leave today, stop by Next Steps. We'll put a free one in your hand because we want you to have access to God word, God's word. Here's the second thing. i got to run. Uh, <clears throat> second thing, stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Stand firm against the schemes of the devil. The number one tactic of the enemy is to get you and I to fight against one another. In the last election season, I watched Christians become foolish over social media because they thought they were enemies. Well, they think differently than me, then they're my enemy. No. Well, they vote different than me, they're my enemy. Look at what Paul has to say for you and I as we look at fighting against the schemes of the enemy. Ephesians chapter 6, 1, or 11 through 12. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Who's he talking about? He's saying the people that you see around you, the people that think different than you, that live differently than you, that vote differently than you, you think those people are, you, are who you're fighting against? You've missed it. Because right. our battle is not against flesh and blood. You have a pastor, you don't know them. I do. It's not them. Right. They're not your enemy. Your battle is not against flesh and blood. Your battle is against rulers and principalities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The enemy's goal is to pit you and I against one another because if we spend all of our time fighting each other, then we never watch his schemes. Because you can't fight an enemy that you're ignoring. So he pits you against other people and he's had you, you, you turn your back on family members and friends because you thought they were my enemy. No, 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 no. Your battle's not against flesh and blood. That's right. You got to be careful that you don't fall into the trap. You're a priest who is called to stand in the middle while people cross from death to life and enter into God's promised land. And as you stand in the middle, there's going to be some people that are trying to cross by that you think to yourself, I don't think they deserve it. Here's the good news. You don't either. That's why grace is so good. When you get to heaven, I think you're going to be shocked by the number of people that made it. You're going to be like, I would never have thought. You're going to find people that were just as undeserving of God's grace as you were. Right. All they had to do was call upon the name of the Lord and they were saved. Yeah. Fight the temptation to battle with gossip and slander and hate towards others. You are called to carry God's presence wherever you go and to whoever you come into contact with. Here's the third thing. We're going to stand firm in the faith. Stand firm in the faith. This is not an encouraging word for you, but as we read through Scripture, Scripture teaches us that the world is going to get worse. I don't think you understand. You got to read through it to really understand, but it gets a whole lot darker 
before light comes in. And it's amazing to me that when we get into an election season that it's almost like Christians believe Jesus is the hope of the world until an election comes. And then we put all of our stock and all of our hope in an individual thinking that they're going to be the one that changes things and turn it around. Listen, uh, God has only sent one person into the world to save the world. And it's not going to be a presidential candidate. His name is Jesus. He paid for your sins. And when he comes back, you ain't going to worry about a ballot. We've got to be people who stand firm in the faith even as the world gets worse because what Scripture actually promises us is that there is pending persecution that's coming to the church. Yeah. You go, well, I'm not. I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to fight for my God-given right. Can I tell you what your God-given right is? Suffering. Oh. Persecution. No, 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 but in the Constitution... Uh, the Constitution does not have equal authoritative weight as Scripture. That's right. You didn't catch it. It's fine. You can send an email to apicket at propel.church. <laughs> we stand firm in the faith. Persecution could happen. And in all honesty, I'm just going to shoot straight with you. I think it would be one of the best things for the American church to actually experience persecution. Because when you look at persecu the persecuted church globally, when you look at places where uh, people can't legally gather in churches, when you look at places where people will go to jail for having a Bible in their hands, those people don't, don't just toss God's Word on a coffee table and sit it and forget it. This is life to them. Those people aren't worried about, well, the room is too hot this morning. Did you know they got rid of hot cocoa? I ain't trying to be petty. I'm trying, I'm trying to preach. I might be a little petty, you know. <laughs> that Ritalin ain't kicked in yet. All right, so <laughs> persecution is necessary. When you look at the persecuted church around the world, it's growing and thriving at a significantly faster rate than the American church. That's right. Because a persecuted church is actually a thriving church. This is what the text says, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for faith of the gospel. Here's what I know. I have no clue what's going to happen in 2024. I don't know the results of the election, and I'm never going to get up here on Sunday and go, the Lord has given me a word about who our next president is. That ain't me. Here's what I do know. Regardless of what the world throws at us, I'm called to live in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. Right. I've predetermined it. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what, how dark the world gets. I'm going to live in a way that honors God. And here's the fourth thing. I'm going to stand firm in my focus. Stand firm in your focus. It's going to be really hard to stand firm in 2024 if your focus is on the wrong stuff. I think about these priests who were carrying the presence of God. Remember, two million people are crossing, and it's getting heavy. Their knees are getting tired. And as, these, as they're standing there thinking about giving up, I think if you don't think about throwing in the towel with Christianity every now and then, you ain't doing it right. Because, like, you ain't risking enough. There's times I feel like throwing in the towel. But what keeps me in the game is I see faces Come on. that are crossing yeah. from death to life. Amen. I see faces of people who wouldn't be here if I didn't make the decision to endure through the difficulties, to have my focus on what God has actually called me to, which is to build His kingdom. So in 2 Timothy, it says this, Soldiers, don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. Soldiers operate on the instructions of their commanding officer. And so when Paul writes this to Timothy, who is a young leader beginning to pastor a church, he wants to make sure that he understands that he's called to be a soldier. 
to not get caught up in the affairs of civilian life. Like, what does that mean? Well, the, another translation says entangled. And to not get entangled up in all of that it means you don't, you don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Yeah, but they're posting this and they're doing that. The mark of maturity is self-control. You have the ability to keep scrolling and not scroll back. Don't get entangled. Don't get caught up. Because when you do, you lose your focus. And when you lose your focus, you miss out on what God has called you to do as a follower of Jesus. I'm going to stand in the middle. I remember in 2020, uh, people every, there would be news articles almost every day. Something, something was happening. And my inbox would get flooded. Every time a new article broke out, people would say, Pastor, what do you think about this? And finally, I just had to come out and say, hey, listen, I am not CNN. <laughs> I do not feel obligated to comment on everything that's going on in the world. I'm aware of it. I know about it. But I'm going to stay focused on what God has called me to do. There are hundreds of thousands of people that are in the Mount Pleasant and the surrounding areas, mostly the surrounding areas. I was at the town meeting this week. I got to tell you this real quick. I was at the town meeting this week, and they celebrated. The town of Mount Pleasant grew by 17 people this year. Come on. Yeah, we're now at 1,747 people in the town of Mount Pleasant. We're going to reach 50% of the, of the population before too long. Come on, somebody. Why, why am I willing to stand in the middle? Because I know there are so many people that haven't crossed over yet. There are so many people that are hopeless that I have the opportunity to bring hope to. There are so many people that are bound but can be set free. There are so many people that are walking around with the scales of religion on their eyes that they can fall off. There are hundreds of thousands of people throughout North Carolina that need to have an encounter with God's promised son. And so I'll stand here in the middle as long as it takes for every single person to cross. You say, Nick, that's great, but but here I don't I think if Jesus were here, he'd pick a side. I was reading through scripture today, the other day when I was preparing. And I saw something really interesting. I've never really thought much about it. But all of God's word is completely intentional because just as the ark points us to Jesus, I believe the priests standing in the middle point us to Jesus as well. And there's no greater example of living in the middle than Jesus on the cross. Matthew 27, 38 says there were two rebels that were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left, which means Jesus was in the middle. And as Jesus stood in the middle, he stands in the middle and hung on the middle cross so that just as God made a way where there was no way for the people to cross into the promised land, he made a way for you and I to enter in to the promised land with him through Jesus standing in the middle. Jesus came and lived a sinless life so that you and I didn't have to come to God through a priest, but instead we could have a high priest named Jesus who would live sinlessly, sacrifice his life, die a brutal death that we deserved. And on that middle cross, he was thinking about you and he was thinking about me. And as he hung there, his focus is set. So I'll stay here as long as it takes for the sins of the world to be paid. And as he breathes his last breath and then three days later would be resurrected, he was resurrected so that anyone who believes in him could cross over from death to life. If you're currently a believer in Jesus, my challenge for you in 2024 is to unpack Scripture for yourself. And see what it would look like to live in the middle. Again, I'm not telling you not to go on the, the red or the blue. You pray through all that. 
but the world is watching. The world is watching how you live. And your political opinions do not trump your God-given mandate to reach the world. What's your focus on? For others of you in the room, maybe you don't have a relationship with God yet because you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. When he died on a cross, he died for you. You say, Pastor, if you knew my life, if you knew what I've done, you wouldn't say Jesus died for me. No, no, he did. He came knowing all the mistakes you would make in life. And on that middle cross, he chose to die in your place. So with every head bowed, every eye closed in the room for a moment, if you're here and you need to begin a relationship with Jesus, would you just lift your hand for a moment and say, that's me. Here's what we're going to do, church. Nobody prays alone. We all pray together. Repeat this after me. Dear Jesus, today I give you my life. I place my hope and trust in you. Thank you for dying in my place so that I could have new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us at Propel Church today. My name is Pastor Nick Newman, and on behalf of myself and our whole team here, we are so grateful that you chose to engage with our worship experience today and hear God's Word. We would love to help you take a next step, but the only way we can do that is if you engage with us. So do us a favor. Go to propel.church. If you feel led to uh, take a next step today, our website will walk you through that. And if you feel led to give, you can click the giving tab to partner with us financially to continue to impact Mount Pleasant and the surrounding areas for Jesus.